Hopefully, since you stumbled across this podcast, you understand that I might be talking about topics that are a little bit sensitive for some people and can be a little bit triggering at times for other people. So if you are one of those people that have a tendency to feel that way, please keep that in mind while listening to this podcast. Beautiful. Who gets that excited Ooh. about that shoes? Those are ugly. Them are cute. Hey guys, have you thought about making your own podcast, but you're not really sure where to start? That's how I was at first, and really the only choice that stood out to me was Anchor. And let me tell you why. It was completely free to start, and it has all the tools that allow me to record and edit my podcast right from my phone or computer. And they distribute the podcast for me, so it's heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other platforms. There's no minimum listenership, and you can start making money from day one. And really, everything you need to make your podcast is all in one place. I love it, and I know you will too. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Sinister Story Hour podcast with Steph. I have another really disgusting, gruesome story for you tonight. Are you ready for that? Mm-hmm. Seems like all of your... Yeah, it seems like this is, <laughs> this is kind of a theme we've gone down. And I, I don't think you get a true crime story without a little bit of gruesome in it, but this yeah. is a little bit exceptional. So um, thank you for joining me again. Mm-hmm. It's good to be back. I don't think we have any other things to discuss, so we'll just get right into the story. Um, I... One thing, as I started researching this, just came out, um, and I, a couple months ago, a situation happened where we had, um, I had just came to my mind that we just really don't teach our boys how to deal with predators or, or domestic violence issues or anything like that. You as a young man, do you feel like you were well equipped to deal with a domestic violence relationship issue. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think we talk about it as a society. I think we just kind of don't talk about it. I think we assume that it's gonna be the men that are doing everything. And okay, so that's exactly what I wanted to talk about for a second as we go into this. Um, that situation when it happened, it became really, really apparent to me that we teach our little girls how to be safe a lot more than we do boys. We teach our little girls, we talk to them about how to be safe and how to watch out for people, how to be careful and how to report things, how to talk about things. We talk to them a little bit more openly. We're still not there yet, but I think that we tell our boys, go be nice to the girls. And um, so that stood out to me. And I, at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about domestic violence and what it looks like, but um, we're going to talk about a person that was a very, very violent person, and it was uh, domestic violence times four, really, because we're going to talk about her four relationships that we know of, and um, every single one of them had followed the same pattern Mm -hmm. and uh, ended badly. So I think that it's just a really important message to get out there that it can happen to anybody. Catherine... Uh, started out with a pretty rough childhood Um, and by pretty rough I mean rough childhood so her parents are Jack and Barbara Rowan depending on where you looked for the pronunciation but I'm going to pronounce it as Rowan they live in Aberdeen Australia so it's a very very rural area very conservative just like what we're used to um, here so Barbara her mom uh, Catherine's mom ends up having an affair with her husband's friend and coworker. They both work at the abattoir, the local abattoir. Have you ever heard of an abattoir? I haven't. I Googled because I have never heard of such a word. Um, it's a meat plant. It's a slaughterhouse. And so we don't call them anything fancy like an abattoir, but um, I have I, I have experience working in a place like this. And so we'll talk about the abattoir a little bit further, but the her family, that was basically the business they were all in, the industry, seemed like in that town, like the slaughterhouse and mines were the two 
major industries where people worked. So her mom, Barbara, and Mr. Kin end up having an affair and it rocks the whole town because they're pretty well known families in the area. And um, she ends up actually having to move away. So she leaves the area with Kin. They go live in a different place because they just, there was a lot of backlash. So two of her children end up going with an aunt and two of her children stay with the dad. So she leaves, goes with Ken, and um, moves away. Her and Ken end up having four children as well. So she, in total, had eight, four, eight, eight kids. Um, so two of those children are actually Catherine and her uh, twin sister. So Catherine was, was a twin. So Jack Rowan ends up dying later, and so the two boys end up having to come and live with the mom again with Barbara and Ken. Um, so they have a house of six kids, it sounds like, and Ken is not a nice guy. So not a good situation to be in. Um, he was a very violent alcoholic, and there was a lot of abuse, a lot of violence, and he would actually rape her mother in front of her up to 10 times a day. So um, that that was something that, can you imagine seeing as a child, that's your normal life? Um, I, I can't even imagine. So at one point she actually complains to her mother about um, her partner wanting to take part, wanting her to take part in a sex act and she's not wanting to. And her mom replies just to put up with it and stop complaining. So uh, that's what we're dealing with. I mean, that's what education she's getting from her, from her parents, okay? She also claims that she was uh, sexually assaulted by several family members up until the time that she was 11. So um, she says that it was not her dad, but there were other, several other family members. And so it does seem like it's just the culture of that family. Definitely um, not a good situation for a child. The only person that she was ever close to um, that I could find was her uncle. And he ends up committing suicide around the time she was 14. And she still remains that his ghost still visits her regularly. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> Pretty attached. <laughs> yeah, I guess they were very close. Um, so in school, she's a bully. So she gets bullied at home. She's seeing this at home. She goes to school. She likes to be mean to the younger children. She loves intimidating people. Um, she it kind of, that stays with her, her throughout her entire life. That feeling of going and being the one that's intimidating the littler person and the person who's kind of the, the underdog. So she never, le she never learns to read or write and she actually drops out of school at 15. So the fact that she was 15 years old and she still couldn't read or write. Yeah, I was about to say. I can't imagine going to school with not being able to read or write either. So even at 15. So she, um, she goes, she drops out and she actually goes to work. So uh, her job is, her first job is a cutter at a clothing factory. So she's cutting uh, material at a clothing factory until she ends up being able to land what she calls her dream job. And that was at the abattoir. She, her dream job, um, she ends up having there uh, about a year later. So she was very young when she started working there. So um, at the abattoir, she's kind of in her element. She has a very, very intense fascination with the macabre, very intense, fascination with dark movies same yeah, you. That's all I you. <laughs> she does have a, a fascination with death and she's kind of intrigued by working around death so at the abattoir she takes a lot of delight in working there and actually being able to to cut the meat to see the blood she would actually nick the arteries of the cattle just to watch them bleed. So it was a little extra. I mean, that's extra. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, she reportedly had loved to cut into the marrow, and she was just fascinated that she could finally use sharp knives and that she was able to do these things. So she starts off at the abattoir working in the offal department. Um, so the offal department, um, it, it sounds awful, right? It's, it's actually O-F-F-A-L. So the offal department is dealing with specialty meats like a uh, kidney, heart, liver, those kind of things. So not your, your normal type of meats, but those are your, 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 your organs and entrails and things like that is what they're dealing with in the offal department. So, um, she starts off there at one point she's transferred to um, boning to the boning department so as um, someone that was in boning your primary function is to remove the muscle from the the muscle and the bone from the carcass before it gets chilled okay so you're you're working all day with knives and it is an extremely strenuous job there's a lot of work that goes into it at this particular plant it said they were slaughtering around 600 a day and so there was a lot of work that they were doing um, the plant that I am familiar with uh, they actually slaughtered 2400 a day and it was constant um, chain of cutting and it's rigorous work it is hard work with your hands um, and the, the knives, of course, have to be very, very sharp. So uh, one thing that stood out to me is that she was, <laughs> she was finally issued her, her very own set of extremely sharp knives, and she was so proud. <laughs> she takes the knives home, and she hangs them above her bed. And so she's that proud, and that became a habit throughout her entire life. She continued to do that throughout her entire life and would keep um, those sharp knives hung by her bed. And she said uh, that they would always be handy if she needed them. So uh, she meets her first husband, David Kellett. We've got two Davids and then we go into two Johns. Okay, so two Davids. This is the first David. So David one is David Kellett. She meets him at the abattoir. He's actually a friend of one of her family members. And he's a raging, violent al alcoholic. So, seems like it's right up her alley. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> familiar territory, right? You usually go for things that are familiar. So, um, and they he was a lot shorter than her. She was a very tall lady. And so, he was a lot shorter. And if he got into a bar fight and couldn't, I guess, handle it or or uh, she didn't like how it was going, she would actually step in and fight too. So she was just kind she of She was a, a lady. She was a lady <laughs> in every aspect. She was a she was a dame, classy dame. <laughs> so um she was just used to the constant violence. I mean that was just her life. That was what she'd grown up to. And, and he begins to see that she's holding her own in all the drunken scuffles and he kind of I think is a little set back by it because I you know it's probably a little different for him but so before long she definitely has the upper hand in the relationship she is kind of wearing all the pants in this relationship mm -hmm. um, she coaxes him into marrying her even though that's not what she wanted or what he wanted um, at their wedding, his, this, you're going to think this is crazy. So at their wedding, Catherine's mom gives her new son-in-law some helpful advice. So this is a great wedding day. This is perfectly beautiful advice that you'd want to get on your wedding day. Um, so this is what he said that he was told on his wedding day. And I'm going to be swearing a few times in this quote, but... Um, so if you don't want to hear the swearing, fast forward me for a second, but he was quoted saying, uh, the old girl said to me to watch out. She said, you better watch with, you better watch this one.